Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back to this second part of medical law. And in this part, I'm going to discuss the uh, the Constitution and medical law because the Constitution is the Supreme Court of uh, with the Supreme Court in our country, and therefore everything that is not compliant with the Constitution, of course, is invalid. So I hope you look forward to this discussion. So I'm going to share my screen with you. There you go. So that is medical law and the Constitution. And as you should know by now, is that I am Professor Slobbert and I will be giving you the, the lecture. Sorry, I'm just struggling. OK, there you go. Medical law and the Constitution. So first of all, let me just give a brief introduction or a, a explanation of what you will find in your theory. There's something like healthcare law or medical law. These are basically the same but they use it interchangeably and overseas differently, et cetera. But healthcare law and medical law is more or less the same. Medical law, the biggest focus is on medical negligence, whereas healthcare law will also include things like in vitro fertilization, organ transplants, stem cell transplants, um, all the, the broader scope of things. But you will see it, it, it is not it is not extremely important that you use it um, correctly because it is um, it encompasses everything in the healthcare sector. And you will see when you read books from overseas that they also speak of tort, tort law. And that is more or less the same as our law of delict. But you will come across that. Don't worry, it is just semantics. Then you must um, realize that in South Africa, we have a public sector and a private sector. And in a certain sense, we are unique with this. So you need to understand the difference. Just a side note is that we do not have national health insurance yet. That is envisaged for um, the year 2026, but there's only a bill at this stage and a lot of negotiations still necessary before we have national health insurance. In uh, Britain, they have um, a national health service, which is also different from our system. But in South Africa, we have a public health care sector and a private sector. Briefly, what is the difference? As I've explained in the previous video, that the MEC of each province is at the head of the public sector of health in that province. And that means that all the people working in the public sector are employees of the state. This is very important to remember because they are employees vicarious liability that the employer becomes responsible for the actions of the employees comes into play. That is not the case in the private sector. In the private sector, all doctors, specialists, etc., they are independent contractors and they do not work for the hospital. Also in the private sector, the nurses they, some of them might be employees of the hospital. Others might be independent contractors or work for an organization that provides um, services of nurses. So there's a huge difference that you need to understand. In the public sector, they are employees. Therefore, they are contracts of employment of what is expected of them and what not. And at the end of the day, the MEC, and sometimes you will also see that they even cite the premier of the province as well. When things go wrong in the public sector, you will therefore sue the MEC in that province as the employer, the state, which is the employer 
of every person in the health sector, in the public sector. But in the private sector, if things go wrong in a hospital, it will depend whether it is a mistake from the hospital side or the nursing staff or the doctor or specialist. Because the doctor and the specialist are independent contractors, therefore the hospital, the private hospital, is not responsible for their actions. So you will have to determine who you will sue if there is a, um, an alleged medical negligence case. Is it against the doctor or is it against the hospital or both? But this is just um, uh, the introductory remarks. As we carry on through the module, I will come back to this and, and allude to the difference again. Then the Constitution, as I've said, is the most important piece of legislation in our country, and therefore it is always in the background. Now there's something very important that you must remember as a way of introduction, and I will come back to this many times in the discussions to follow. When there are no damages, there will be no claim. And I cite a case there for you, Mbele versus the MEC for Health of Gauteng, and it is a case that went to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Please make a plan to read that case. That is extremely important, and I'm going to indicate to you what I mean when there are no damages by way of two examples. Say, for example, I have a son of 19 years. In other words, he's above 18. He is an adult. So, but he is still living with me. He is a student. I support him. He does not have a wife, he does not have children, he does not have responsibilities that he must pay for. So he is, in fact, my responsibility. So that boy of 19, one evening goes out, have a few drinks, there's an accident, he goes to hospital. In hospital, because of negligence, he dies. What then happens? It will be of no use for me to go and institute an action. Why? Because what damage did I suffer? Yes, of course, I lost a son. Yes, of course, it is traumatic, it is painful, but there's no damages that I suffered because he did not support me. He did not have children. So there's no damages to be quantified except my pain and suffering, which is not quantifiable unless, of course, I end up in a psychiatric unit, but that will be the exception. So in that case, even though how sad it may be. And one feel your whole heart will scream, that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. There will be no damages. There will be no claim. Now let's take the same scenario. My son of 19 years still doesn't have a wife nor children, doesn't support anyone. I support him, has a few drinks, there's an accident, he goes to hospital, and there's negligence, and he becomes paralyzed. Then, of course, he, not me, he will have a claim. He will have a claim, and he will claim a lot of money, lost of future earning, lost of the amenities of life, pain and suffering. Then you will have a case. Do you see the difference? Damages, damages, damages. Otherwise, it is not worth instituting an action because if you cannot prove damages, there is no case. In that case of Mbele versus MEC for Health, you will see 
you will see how the court argued around the, um, the allowance of an amount for pain and suffering. What happened in that case is the woman gave birth, the baby was stillborn, and then she was taken back to the maternity ward to be amongst all the other mothers with their babies. Later, she was taken to the mortuary to identify her newborn, and then she just completely collapsed. And the court awarded 100,000 rand for pain and suffering. But as I say, that is the exception. I just want to make an, uh, another another comment here on locus standi. Who can go to court? It must be the person affected. In other words, Miss Mbele went to court because she suffered the pain and damage. Her husband couldn't go on her behalf, nor her son. It must be the patient who suffered the damages. Unless, of course, it's the death of a breadwinner, then the people who that person supported, they can institute an action. But please go and read that case so that you can see and make it clear in your mind that you cannot, even though how sad it will be if my son of 19 years die because of negligence, there will be no case because I will not be able to prove what damages I have suffered except my pain and suffering, which is not quantifiable and not worth a court case. Having said that, now you must keep in your mind that what are the requirements of a delict? Those of you who have an LLB, you must now go back and remember what you've studied. Those that do not have an LLB, a delict is, is when the rights of another individual was violated. So in, to, in order to prove that a wrong was done to you, you must prove that there was conduct, that the conduct was wrongful, that there was fault either intentionally or negligently. There must be causation between what the person did and what the outcome is, and of course the person that have been um, um, violated must prove that he or she suffered damages. Then there are also requirements for a contract. Try to remember what those are, but I'll come back to that. Why do I say what are the requirements of a delict and what are the requirements of a contract? It is because when you sue in any alleged medical negligence case, it will be done on the basis of either a delict or a contract or both. But there's a difference. So I ask the question, what is the difference between claiming damages after the breach of a contract or under a delict? The difference between the two is that when a contract is breached, you cannot claim non-patrimonial damages. Under a contract, you cannot claim for pain and suffering. Under a delict, if you prove all the requirements, you can claim for pain and suffering. But remember now, you must prove damages as well. So that is the biggest difference between the two. But as we carry on, I will come back to this again. So most medical negligence cases will be based on a delict or on both. Very few cases will only be based on a contract. Don't worry if it is overwhelming. As we carry on through all the units, it will become much clearer and you will understand everything at the end. So our main focus with this recording is medical law and the constitution. Before we, we go to the detail of delict and contract, we must first establish what is the effect of the constitution on medical law. First thing to notice is how do we cite 
or refer to the Constitution. It is the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa and then a comma, 1996. In other words, we do not say Act 108 of 1996 because there's another act that prescribes the title of the Constitution. So in the Constitution, we have the Bill of Rights, Chapter 2. And I'm going to highlight a few of those as they are applicable in a healthcare context, context. So the first one is the right to equality. And that you will find in Section 9 of the Constitution. And now I come back to my previous comment about the difference between the public sector and the private sector. Okay. So the right to equality means that every person must be treated equally. So there should not be any discrimination. What does that mean? If I can give an example in a healthcare context. Because the people working in the public sector are employees, they have no choice whom they want to treat or not. They must comply with their contract of employment. In other words, they must do what is stipulated in their contract of employment, and they cannot choose not to do certain things. Example, abortion. It is legal to have an abortion in South Africa according to the, termination, the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act. So any girl can go to a public hospital and ask for an abortion. If you now work in the public sector, remember you are an employee and you must comply with your contract of employment. And because there is a legal right for abortions in South Africa, you are supposed to comply and help this girl with a legal abortion. If it is against your religion or your culture. Remember, those are also protected in Chapter 2 of the Constitution. Then you do not have to do it. But, and this is very important, you cannot leave the girl and just say to her that you do not do abortions. You have to, and that is compulsory, to refer her to someone who will do it. Side note, you cannot even um, um, uh, uh, talk to the girl and, and try to, to change her mind. You, you do not have that right to do it. You must respect her autonomy. So if you don't want to do it, respect her autonomy, her choice, and refer her to someone who will do it. If you try to influence her, you might end up in court because you have no right to do that. Let's move over to the private sector. In the private sector, a private practitioner have a choice. He or she have a choice whom to accept as patients, as long as it is not based on discrimination. In other words, a private practitioner can decide when he or she wants to work, whether it be only Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. They can choose they only want 50 patients. They can choose that they only want to specialize on, on um, reproductive organs or whatever. As long as they do not discriminate on any basis, as stated in the Constitution. In other words, you cannot have a private practice for men only, or a private practice for some or other cultural group only, because that will be discrimination and that is not allowed. So although you as a private practitioner have freedom to choose how you want to run your practice, you're not allowed to discriminate on any of the grounds in the Constitution. And remember that a private practitioner is an independent contractor. They are not employees of a hospital. Okay, so no discrimination whatsoever, either in the public sector or the private sector. Then human dignity. 
That is section 10 of the Constitution. And there I give you a quote from the case of S versus Makwanyani, which is the case that considered the death penalty. And there it was said that human beings are entitled to be treated as worthy of respect and concern. Every person has dignity just by the fact that you are a human being. In a healthcare context, then, it plays out in that you have to show dignity to your patient if you are the doctor or the nurse. You have to show, show dignity to the family, but also to the staff, to your colleagues. And then I add, if you show dignity to yourself, the others will also follow. But people must be treated with dignity. And sometimes when you read in the media what happens in hospitals, that pregnant women have to lie on the grounds before they give birth, etc., or they are just fed plain uh, brown bread with any butter or anything, then ask the question, is that human dignity? What does this mean? This means that when you are confronted with a possible medical negligence case, check for these things. Was there any discrimination? Was any of the people involved, was their dignity violated? Because then you add that to your claim. Okay, let's carry on. The right to life in section 11. Now, this is very interesting because if we speak of the right to life, the other side, the flip side is, do we have a right to die? I'll come to that. The cases that I've quoted there is the Stransom Ford case versus the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services in 2015, and it went to the Gauteng Province High Court. Mr. Stransom Ford was suffering and was in immense pain. He was terminally ill and he wanted to die because he couldn't take the pain anymore and they, there was no hope for recovery at all. Therefore, he went to court and he asked permission so that he could be assisted in order to die. In other words, we label that as assisted suicide. He couldn't do it on his own anymore. He needed a prescription from a doctor, which he could then drink or it could be administered via a syringe and then he will die in his sleep and it will be peaceful and it will be dignified. So he went to court and he asked the court to grant him that permission. Unfortunately, he died the morning of the judgment and therefore judgment was given in his favor, but it was after he had already died, unfortunately. And therefore, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services versus Estate, because he's now dead, so they speak of Estate Transom Ford, went to the Supreme Court of Appeal and they said that the judgment must be set aside. It should never have been given because the plaintiff died before judgment was given and also that it shouldn't have been allowed. The court said there's a lot more to be discussed about physician-assisted suicide, and therefore um, the appeal was upheld. Now, those two cases are quite important. If you are interested in the field of euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide, what is important is that it is illegal in South Africa to do that. Things are changing worldwide. So in the case of Carter versus Canada, if you want to read it for yourself, that is where Canada allowed assisted suicide. It is also not, it has always been allowed in the Netherlands, in the state of Oregon, in the USA, in Switzerland. It is now also allowed in Australia and New Zealand. So I ask again, do we have a right to die? in South Africa? And the short answer is no, we do not 
have a right to die. And that now brings me to the legal side. What is the status of a living will? A living will is where that is a document that that you draw up when you are still alive and there you indicate that should you become unconscious or in such a state of mind that you cannot make decisions anymore or where you are kept artificially alive that the machines should be switched off and that you should be allowed to die. In other words, it is a document that you usually keep with your will or your final testament and it indicates to those staying behind what your wishes are. That is not a valid legal document in South Africa. What do I mean by that is that you will not be able to go to court and sue over the validity of a living will or that the living will um, should be given effect to. It is not a valid legal document, unfortunately. It is just a directive to the people staying behind what to do or what decisions to take or what is your will in a specific situation. And that then brings us to active and passive euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Okay. Euthanasia is when you, you kill someone. To put it that bluntly, because it is illegal in our country, you would, will kill that person and that will be murder. We distinguish between active and passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia is where you inject someone with a lethal uh, dose, so you actually kill that person or you give that person something to drink that will actively end that person's life. So that is completely illegal in South Africa. Passive euthanasia is more difficult, although it is also um, technically illegal, it does happen in some instances. Passive euthanasia is where you do nothing. In other words, the diagnosis of the person is so bad, he or she will die within a couple of hours or in a few days. Then you do nothing to assist. In other words, you do not feed that patient or you do not put that patient on machines to keep him or her artificially alive. You leave nature to take it, its course and then the person dies. This happens in, in, in hospitals and it is not prosecuted. It depends on, on what basis the decisions are made. It's usually the family and the, the health professionals that will sit around the table and discuss it and then decide. The, the prognosis is so bad. Even if the person lives, the person will not be conscious about him or her being alive. And then they discuss all the nitty-gritty detail and then take a decision to leave the person. And then nature takes its course and the person dies. Physician-assisted suicide is where you get the help of a physician. In other words, you indicate that, you know, you are terminally ill, you are constantly in pain. Then you ask your physician to give a prescription of a, a medicine that will let you die peacefully. That is also not allowed in South Africa, and that is the basis on which Mr. Stansom Ford went to court. He wanted to be assisted. So both, all three of them, active, passive, and physician-assisted suicide, at this moment in time, is illegal in South Africa. There's a lot of debate on social media, in, um, television programs, where they discuss it. As the people argue, that you should have the right to decide for yourself based on your own self-determination and your own autonomy, that when the pain becomes so unbearable that you would rather die um, with dignity, being assisted, than 
to to die of immense pain or to to commit suicide by shooting yourself, etc. It is much more dignified to be helped. Of course, people differ. People have different views on it. And therefore, keep your eyes open. There's a hard case. It started in February where um, a person who is terminally ill, his, um, he, his, um, his health is deteriorating and he will reach a point where he will not be able to commit suicide himself anymore. So while he is still capable of arguing and helping himself, he is now asking the court to be allowed when the time comes that he cannot help himself anymore or that he cannot kill himself anymore, that he be assisted by a physician. Judgment has not yet been given. Therefore, the current position in South Africa is that we do not have a right to die. A living will is not a legal document that you can litigate in court um, on the basis of that living will. It is only a direction to the family of the person to make certain decisions. Both active and passive euthanasia is illegal in South Africa as well as physician-assisted suicide. Okay, then, of course, we back to the Constitution. Um, equality, remember there's an act also, the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act. As I've said, that you cannot, even if you are in private practice, um, discriminate because there is a specific act apart from also the Constitution. One that is very important in a healthcare context is the freedom and security of the person, Section 12, because that is, that is the crux of the matter where autonomy is given recognition to, that you can decide what happens with your body while you are a living person, and we argue that you should also have that right when you are dead. But that is an important one. It's also the basis for informed consent. So when we, we discuss informed consent, I will refer back to Section 12 of the Constitution, the freedom and the security of a person, your right to self-determination. The right to privacy, that is, of course, also protected, and we all know that the a Protection of Personal Information Act, the POPIA, is now um, effective and one must comply with that. We know about the, um, the um, trust be between a doctor and a patient. And it is very good to go and also read the HPCSA booklets on patient confidentiality and the right to privacy. Then section 27 is very important. And please note that whenever you quote this part, that it is done correctly, no one in South Africa have the right to health care. We all have the right to access to health care. There's a huge difference. We do not have an automatic constitutional um, right to health care. We only have the right to access to health care. And there is a very important court case, which I will um, recommend that you go through. It's the case of Subramani versus the Minister of Health in KwaZulu-Natal. It's quite an old case. You will see it's 1989. But in that case, Mr. Subramani he, um, his kidney, he had kidney failure and he needed dialysis. So he started with his dialysis in the private sector, paying for it, his medical aid, etc. But his funds were depleted and then he moved over to the public sector. And he asked the public sector that he should be accommodated on a dialysis machine because of kidney failure. But... In the public sector, there are certain requirements for you to be able to access dialysis. And one of them is that you must be a candidate for an organ transplant, for a kidney transplant. And unfortunately, Mr. Subramani was not a candidate for a transplant because he suffered from other illnesses as well. And therefore, the public sector said, 
that they cannot accommodate Mr. Subramani on a dialysis machine because of a shortage of machines. There's only so many machines available in the public sector, and therefore they will prioritize the people that are transplant candidates. And therefore, sorry, Mr. Subramani, because of a lack of resources, we cannot assist. And he was basically sent home to die, and he died. But on the basis of that case, which is a constitutional course, um, court case, the public sector tends to shield away from responsibility and then saying lack of resources. Because in that case, it was said, if there is a lack of resources, then it is not compulsory for the public sector to provide a service. I think it's an easy way out to quote this case and say lack of resources. Therefore, we couldn't assist here and there. And I would like that case to be challenged again. But of course, it, that's just my opinion. It's not a fact. It's just my opinion. You can read the case and decide for yourself. Is, hasn't it become too easy for the state to hide and say a lack of resources? Not, I'm not dismissing the fact that there are a, lo um, a loss, um, a, a shortage of resources in the public sector. But sometimes it is just bad management or corruption, and that leads to the lack of resources. So it shouldn't be such an easy excuse, but my opinion. OK, then the rights of children. Whenever you come across a, um, a case where children are involved, and children, I do not only mean those below 18, because it's very important that the Children's Act have different stipulations. They already give children from 12 the right to make certain decisions. So whenever there's children, you go to Section 28 of the Constitution, which basically boils down to the best interest of the child. But you also have to consult the Children's Act and, depending on the case, the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act. But the golden rule, is the best interest of the child. I will also give some examples as we carry on. And then the Access to Information um, Act, um, or the Access to Information in the Constitution, that is Section 32, and there was an act promulgated to, to give substance to the constitutional value, the Promotion of Access of Information Act, and that you will need when you want to have hospital records or the records from the doctor and they don't want to give it to you, but you will find the detail in that book that I spoke about in the first recording that I made from the Jeffer and Lawrenson. They give you the detail how to use the Promotion of Access to Information Act to get hold of hospital or medical records. And um, a case that I quote there is the Initas Hospital versus Van Wyk. It is a Supreme Court of Appeal case in 2006. And that will give you a practical example how to use that act. What did the court take into consideration, etc. And you will learn a lot from the judgment of that specific case. There's just a list of of um, constitutional law um, cases. Remember, um, because of our president system, meaning you have to follow the judgments of the higher courts, you always see when you are faced with a situation, is there a constitutional judgment? And then you start there, and then you go to the judgments of the Supreme Court of Appeal and then the different high courts. So it's quite important to take note that there are constitutional judgments um, given um, and that you should take note of. So the Subramani one I have dealt with. Then the second bullet, the Chabalala Mzimang case, that concerns confidentiality and privacy, if you want to know a little bit more about that. Then H versus the Fetal Assessment Center. That is a very important case to take note of. It, the judgment was given in 2014. 
And briefly, I'm going to discuss what happened in that case. In our legal system, there are basically three claims around pregnancies. The first claim is an unwanted pregnancy. That is where one of the two partners was sterilized, um, yet there's a pregnancy. So something went wrong with the sterilization. If that can be proved that the sterilization was not done perfectly, and then the woman conceives again, and a, ba a healthy baby is born, that is an unwanted pregnancy, and you can go to court and you can sue the gynecologist or the doctor involved for negligence because you were not sterilized and you did not use any other precaution when you had sex and you fell pregnant again. So it's an unwanted birth, but the baby is healthy. So you will claim the upbringing costs for that child because that you didn't want that child for whatever reason. And that is why you, you asked for a sterilization. The sterilization was not done according to the standards. You fell pregnant again. Now there's a baby and the baby is costly. So now you claim for the upbring cost of that child. That is a valid claim in our legal system. Then we have another one. Unwanted birth. That is a different scenario. The people wanted a baby. In other words, they had sex with the intention of conceiving a baby. But during the pregnancy, the woman goes to a doctor, whether it be a gynecologist, obstetrician, or a GP, it doesn't matter. And she specifically asks that doctor to check for abnormalities of the fetus. Because if they detect an abnormality, then she would rather abort the baby. So that is her explicit wish. She wants tests to be done. And if the tests prove positive, she will opt for an abortion. So now she goes to the doctor. The doctor does the test but negligently fails to see the signs, let's say, of Down syndrome or spina bifida. And he tells the woman that the baby is fine and normal. And she gives birth to the baby only to then discover that the baby suffers from some or other abnormality. Then she can sue the doctor and the basis for that claim will be an unwanted birth. It will be instituted by the parents of the, and I say that in inverted commas, of the abnormal child, the child suffering from certain illnesses. It is the parents who will bring that claim and it will be alleged that the doctor was negligent in telling them that there is something wrong with the fetus, because if they knew that, but for the wrong information, they would have opted for an abortion. They did not have that choice. Now a baby is born with special needs, which is costly. So the parents will institute a claim and then claim mon money in order to support this disabled child. Remember prescription, the parents have to do it within three years. It is the parents who claim and the damages will be awarded to the parents who will then use that money in order to look after this disabled child. Also valid in our legal system have always been a valid claim. Then there's a third one and that is unwanted life. That was not recognized in our legal system for a long time until this case, H versus Fetal Assessment Center. There, the woman went to a fetal assessment center, specialists, absolute specialists, 
to check whether the baby she was carrying was normal or not. They did the test. They told the woman that the baby was normal. There was no abnormalities and the baby was born with severe abnormalities amongst other Down syndrome, but a lot of other things as well. And then they did not know they could institute an action. They were ordinary people. They did not know. But it was costly and emotionally draining looking after this child. And then they heard about a wrongful life claim, which is considered contra bonus mores, against the morals of society in South Africa. But they took it to court, to the high court, and they asked the high court that they want to institute an action on behalf of their son for unwanted life, wrongful life. In other words, the child, they just assist the child. The child claims that he should never have been born. It is the child that institute the action because at that stage, the child was already six. And remember, where there's a child, there's no prescription. So there's no prescription until the child reaches majority and then three years after that. So they could, the child with the assistance of the parents could institute that action if the court allowed it. Of course, the opposition then said it's contra bonus moris and they filed an exception. And then the parents went over to, um, they did not go to the um, um, Supreme Court of Appeal because they, based on previous judgments, didn't think the Supreme Court of Appeal will grant them what they want. And then they approached the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court then said a claim on wrongful life is now a valid claim in South Africa, depending on the specific facts. In other words, when you go to court and you claim wrongful life, the child is the claimant that claims wrongful life, the, it must be heard in the court and it will depend on the facts. So that is an important case to take notice of because a lot of things in medical negligence goes wrong around um, um, pregnancies. So that is a very important case that you should take cognizance of. Also, the case referred to in that case. OK, the fourth bullet, Lee versus Minister of Correctional Services. That is an excellent case for causation. To see how the courts argue causation, it is a guy that went to a prison and then contracted TB. And then the whole arguments on causation, etc. It's quite a long and a difficult case. But if you want answers on causation, that's an excellent case. As I've said, it's a constitutional court case. Then Opelt versus the head of the Department of Health of the Western Cape. Very, very, very interesting. Very sad case. I will say a little bit of controversial case. It is a rugby player that had a, a neck injury and was moved from this hospital to that hospital to that hospital, time lapsed, and he is paralyzed. The interesting part of that case is there were two teams of experts, and the court favored the one team and gave judgment based on those experts. When I read the case, and this is now again opinion, my opinion, you do not have to agree with me. If you read the case, I favor the other group of experts. I would have given a different judgment. Not to criticize the judgment as is. It's a very good judgment. But it raises the question, which experts do you believe at the end of the day? Very, very interesting case. Really if you've got nothing to do over a weekend, instead of watching Netflix, you can read these cases. Very interesting. The next one on this page, the MEC for Health versus DZ. This is one that you have to 
take cognizance of. In that case, it was argued there is a principle in our law that when you claim damages, you must claim once and for all. You cannot go back and claim again on the same facts. So you must claim everything. Let's say it is a cerebral palsy case where a, a child is born and because of a lack of oxygen becomes paralyzed. Then you will claim the upbringing cost or the medical cost or the past medical cost, the loss of earnings. What would this person have done in his or her life? In other words, the claim will be, let's say, more or less 30 million rand. You have to claim it once and for all. That was the common law principle. And future medical costs, these are estimates that you included what this child might need in future based on expert evaluation. That, that is what, what postulates the amount of 30 million. But in this case, the Constitutional Court said Depending on the facts of each case, the once and for all rule need not be followed always, in the sense that you will not award one lump sum for damages to cover for everything. In other words, the, the plaintiff will not get the 30 million as a lump sum anymore. They changed the common law position. And what they say is that in each case where there is a discussion around future medical costs, then the state must provide it. In other words, there must be an investigation whether the state is able to provide it when and, and as it becomes necessary. In other words, they're not willing to pay out a lump sum once and for all anymore. Depending on the circumstances, if there's a possibility that the therapies or the special treatment that the cerebral palsy child might need can be provided by the state, then it should be provided when it is necessary. They're not going to pay for it anymore in advance. Very important to take note of that case. Then there's also an interesting um, um, new scenario happening because the jurisdiction of the Constitutional Court is now much wider than it used to be. People tend to take um, um, every case uh, to the Constitutional Court. And it is not necessarily always that um, they will be granted permission to, to, to listen to the case because there's no definite constitutional values that are applicable or it is not in the, um, um, the public interest. So these are three very, very recent cases. You will see the one of 2022, the other one of 2022, and the other one of 2021. All three those cases, you must get hold of them and you must read them to see and first establish whether you should go to the Constitutional Court or not. Is there something relevant for the Constitutional Court? Is it in the public interest or not? Or is it just a factual question, a question of causation, and then it is not applicable to the Constitutional Court? These three cases extremely important. So get hold of them, read it on your own. And just remember, when I say these are important, it is not prescribed that you have to go and study it for your test or for the activities unless it is prescribed as, um, as an activity. Then, of course, you have to read it. But these are extra information that you sh should take cognizance of in order to know more about what is happening in the field of medical law in the Constitution. Then there's also an interesting case, which um, and I was involved of in that, just to take cognizance of the voice of the unborn baby versus the Minister of Home Affairs. This is very interesting. According to the Birth and Death Registration Act, a fetus 
that aborts naturally, in other words, a miscarriage before 26 weeks of gestation, of being in the uterus, if there's a spontaneous miscarriage before 26 weeks, then it is automatically treated in our hospitals as medical waste and it will go to an incinerator. After 26 weeks, it is then classified as a stillbirth and a death certificate is issued and the parents can then have a legal burial. So it was challenged in the Constitutional Court on the basis of that it discriminates, that every woman um, goes through a pregnancy different. Some women who has a miscarriage um, at um, the gestational age of 21 weeks would like a funeral, others won't. Anyway, we argued that it should be a choice for the parents of that child, whether they want a burial or not. And it was interpreted that the Birth and Death Registration Act discriminates on that basis. But very interestingly, the Constitutional Court said no, because the fetus before 26 weeks um, is not addressed in the Birth and Death Registration Act, it is not per se, that it must go <clears throat> for medical waste. The law does not say that. So it was interesting, the view that they got. So in, in nowadays, you can have the fetus and have a burial, but there's still some practical problems because the municipal bylaws state specifically that you can only have a, a, a legal valid burial if there's a death notice a death certificate, and now you cannot get that when there's a miscarriage. In other words, the, the different levels of legislation, the Birth and Death Registration Act and the bylaws of a municipality at this stage is not talking to each other. But should you come across um, parents approaching you and say that um, there was a miscarriage and they would like a burial, then just get an affidavit from them and get a, a registered funeral undertaker and allude them to, to this case where it is perfectly argued and then decisions can be taken. The last of the constitutional court cases that I'm discussing is um, Van der Walt versus S. Or, as it was previously, before it ended up in the Supreme uh, in the Constitutional Court, S versus Van der Walt, which indicates it's a criminal case. It's the state against the doctor. And I'm not going to give all the detail about that one. I just wanted you to say that a criminal case ended in the Constitutional Court because I believe it, it will be one of your activities. And I will also discuss it when I discuss um, the criminal field of um, medical law. Okay. Okay, and that is then the end of the PowerPoint for today. So let's just get back to you. Okay, so I hope um, you've got some information on the Constitution. The Constitution is important. It's always there. It's always at the background. Once you are confronted with facts, check whether um, there was a violation of a constitutional right. And then next time we will delve into the more important things, the doctor-patient relationship. But I hope up to now you are learning something and you are enjoying it. Thank you for your participation. Bye-bye until next time.